see a Sasquatch? No, not exactly. What do you mean, not exactly? Well, I've seen a heap of tracks. Some big ones, some little ones. I remember back in 1912 when we was traveling up the Cumbia River way with a bunch of fellers doing a bit of hunting. We stopped to camp for the night. Well, during the night, something snuck into our camp and tore it all to shreds. Maybe it was a bear. Tore it no bear. How do you know you didn't actually see it? Well, I've seen the tracks the next morning. It's about 18 inches long. No bar has feet that big. But how many people have you talked to who have actually seen a Bigfoot? A couple dozen, maybe. Do you believe in that Mount St. Helens story? I sure do. I know the old Fred Beck who told me about it. The way old Beck told it to me, he and three other fellers was working a mine back in 1924 called the Vanderlyte Mine. They'd been prospecting and panning a little gold up in the Lewis River country. This is near Mount St. Helens for going on six years. They was doing pretty well, too. They'd seen a lot of tracks around during the years, and they always just figured them to be tracks of a big engine that was still roaming the hills. On this ticketer day, one of them came back from town with a new assay. It was a dandy. They discovered a pretty good strike of gold, all things considered. 
They're all kind of excited. They decide to knock off for the day and celebrate their good fortune. They headed back for the cabin as usual, along an old, well-used trail. Way up the trail, but again, hear the sounds of footsteps behind them and off the sides, too. Never did see what was in the trees, but something was sure following them. they got back to the cabin, they were pretty scared. Charlie was more scared than the others. And the sounds of those footsteps, it seemed to him like there was more than one of them things out there, whatever it was. Well, they decided they'd eat a quick supper and go to bed. They had heard nothing more from the trees, and they figured that whatever there was out there had gone away. went on for most of the night. Sometimes it was still, and other times it increased. The locks kept crashing down, the cabin kept shaking, and they kept shooting. But they never knew if they hit one of them. Well, just before dawn, the attack stopped. All around the cabin were large footprints of critters. They was over 18 inches long. And there's a ton or two of rocks had been thrown down from the ledge. Fred said the apes had did everything they could to get into the cabin. It was built too solid. To this day, that canyon is called Ape Canyon. Fred always did say to his apes, but the way he described them is a lot bigger than apes. That's some story, Josh. I've heard that same story from a whole lot of people up my way. It's always the same. I'm inclined to believe it's the gospel truth. 
We're going to have a guard tonight. You think we need one? <laughs> hey, don't worry, Bob. I'll set the dogs on both sides of the camp. If anything moves, they'll let us know. <laughs> Just thought I'd ask. <laughs> dogs tonight. They're a little restless. I think they got wind or something. You didn't see the herd of deer that come through this morning, did you? Well, I was awake at dawn. About eight or ten deer comes through about 20 feet away. Come on, Josh. The dogs would have picked up the smell on them deer. Nope. Them deer was too smart. They come downwind of the dogs and made nary a sound passing by. You fellas remind me of the story Hank was telling me about old Bauman back in 1850. Oh. It was told by none other than Teddy Roosevelt, and he even wrote it down in his book. <laughs> I'm not sure I can tell it <clears throat> like Josh could. Yeah, but he's right. It was told by Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy spent a lot of time in that wilderness and was a hard man to fool with a tall tale. He said the story was told to him by an old weather-beaten hunter by the name of uh, Bauman, I think it was. Well, Bauman had to believe that story, because Teddy noted that every time he told it, he couldn't keep him shut up. Well, the whole thing happened back in 1850 when Bauman was a young man. And him and his partner was trapping up in the mountains in Idaho. And not having much luck trapping, Bauman and Jessup, not being superstitious men, decided to go up to a particular small stream that was said to have a lot of fever. Now, but to get to that stream, they had to travel by way of a pass that well, it had an evil reputation ever since a year before when a hunter wandered into it and was killed by some wild beast. Well, Bauman and Jessup, calculating that they couldn't get the horses up the pass, traveled on foot till they reached a beaver swamp where they decided to camp for the night. Well, there's still a few hours of daylight, so they built a small lean-to and went on up the creek with the traps. Now, setting the traps took a little longer than they thought, so they didn't get back to the camp till late in the evening. When they came into the camp, the whole place was just torn up. The lean-to was smashed. Blankets and supplies were just thrown all over the place. And all around the camp, there was footprints just as plain as if they'd been made in snow. And they examined the tracks real close and concluded that whatever it was certainly walked on two legs. Uh, it was getting too dark to tell much. The two men went on to bed with the intentions of studying the tracks in the morning. About midnight, Bauman was awakened by some kind of noise. He saw a black shape come across the front of the lean to it. Grabbed his rifle and fired a shot at it. He could not see what it was. All he knew was that it was running fast. Well, after that, both of them sat by the fire the rest of the night, keeping a close watch for that doggone thing, whatever it was. That thing came back and stood for an hour or so on the trees across the swamp. It made some god-awful sounds, but it didn't come near the camp. In the morning, they both decided to leave the valley just as soon as they could, so they spent the rest of the morning gathering their traps from the creek, and well, you know something? Every trap was just plumb empty. Well, by noon, their fears of the past night just kind of dimmed. Even seemed a little bit foolish. So, uh, since there was only three traps left, Bauman volunteered together, and while Jessup went on into camp to pack up the gear for departure. Bowman returned to the camp. Everything was quiet. He hollered for Jessup. There was no answer. Then 
down the top side of his frame. He was dead. His neck broke, just like it had been nothing but a twig. Jessup was dead. There wasn't nothing Bauman could do but bury him. There wasn't time to do that before dark, so he just grabbed his pack and headed down the horses where they was hobbled, and he lit out of there just about as fast as a couple of scared horses could handle. Bauman said as far as he knew, them traps were still up there on the old Salmon River, along with Jessup's bones. Hank, you think that story is true? I guarantee, doggone to you, a man like Teddy Roosevelt wouldn't have said nothing that didn't believe him. There are lots of stories on record like that. 